And uh, welcome to our Nook at Bible Study tonight. Our topic is life after death, reincarnation versus rapture versus reality. And would you like to join me in an opening prayer if we can get into a, a circle here? <laughs> Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, you are the Word, the Word made flesh. We wish to experience your presence together here this evening, Lord, to see you in the pages of your Word and to get instructions from you for how we are to live in order to be with you. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for coming, friends. Very nice to see you. <clears throat> this is something of a departure. So often what we've done in this Nunclick at Bible Study, well, let me back up a little bit and say Nunclick at Bible Study, the purpose of it, uh, for those of you who are new, is to uh, both to experience the presence of the Lord in the Word and also to read the Bible, nothing but the Bible, and all parts of it uh, through a Swedenborgian lens. That's the purpose of what we're doing. Uh, and part of the purpose behind that is to be prepared for a conversation. Uh, this is the thing that we have in common with two billion people on the planet. Uh, this is still the best-selling book in the world that sends, sells 100 million copies a year of, of this book. So it's worth being very familiar with this book and being able to talk about the new church, being able to argue a new church perspective, uh, using the Bible, nothing but the Bible, and, and the whole Bible. And so that's the purpose of what we're doing. And uh, But tonight is a little bit of a departure from our usual practice because a lot of what we've done in the past is to set up uh, new church concepts against concepts, particularly out of uh, uh, the sort of most popular forms of Christianity today, you know, the evangelical movement and so forth. And, uh, but tonight we're going to be talking also about reincarnation, and, uh, which doesn't come out of that tradition. Uh, reincarnation, as I'm sure I don't have to tell you, is absolutely huge in our world. It's just a massive presence in terms of the way that people think about and understand uh, reality and and so many things that have anything to do with what's spiritual uh, get immediately into into a concept of of reincarnation and uh, in, in fact if you read the Wikipedia article on reincarnation it kind of gives you the impression uh, that the world has gone out after reincarnation and with three exceptions Christianity but there are parts of Christianity that believe in reincarnation, that 24% of Christians believe in reincarnation or something like that from some poll. Uh, Islam, but there are pockets within Islam that believe in reincarnation, and Judaism, but there are pockets within Judaism, most especially the Kabbalah, that believe in reincarnation. So basically, sort of your mainstream uh, Judeo-Christian slash Muslim tradition is the exception to the, the rule, the rule is, is reincarnation. And uh, well, I, I need to do the same thing I do every time because I'm really stuck with it. I, I don't have anything else to offer, uh, which is I can only give you my perspective from my reading and, and so forth, what I believe to be the case. I hope the Lord deals with you, uh, you know, through your perspective of, of what is the case. I can't claim any absolute truth. But uh, from my perspective, some of the ideas that, I, that I'm, I'm looking at in talking about reincarnation is uh, the idea that there's a that there's a higher self uh, that we have uh, this sort of over soul or this soul uh, that is above our consciousness like the highest consciousness we can achieve in this physical time and space self there, there's there's another thing above us and that uh, when a child is born and grows up and lives in this world and dies that's just one of the pieces. Uh, somebody likened it to clothes hanging on a wash line, that you have many of these clothes hanging on there. In some senses, if you look at it above time and space, they may all be there simultaneously. You know, that all these U's are, there's a, there, there are other pieces 
uh, of at least this oversoul or something. And uh, so uh, more external ideas of this is that there are past lives uh, and, and uh, people come back and so on. It's bound up with the idea that you create your own life. Uh, a very interesting th theory that comes along with it is the idea of pre-existence of your life in this physical world and the idea that you sat around with the other people in your life and you decided, I tell you what, I I'll be alcoholic, you get cancer, okay? And we'll have dysfunctional kids, what do you say, you know? And, um, and, and you agree on all that and then you come into this world and you have that experience. Uh, but it's comforting to think that there's some higher part of you that actually chose this madness that you find yourself in now, even though you, as, as a conscious you, had no, no access to that information. Everything's a surprise, everything's a shock. But it's, it's comforting the thought that there's some higher part that did, um, that did actually decide these things and it's all perfect. Because uh, another key notion is the idea of spiritual development that these aren't just pointless but that through each manifestation you're going through some development and, and you're getting better and at least in some traditions the goal is this nirvana at the end of, of times that you be re, you know your consciousness disappears into God you become one one with the divine consciousness kind of thing and uh, obviously some people think that you come back as uh, as animal or whatever um, if you press it, there's, there's not a lot of people who talk in a very technical way about what happens in between, where are you, why do you have that consciousness, how does it work, when you come, do you come right at the moment of conception, or is it a little later, or whatever, and it, you know, there, there's various things that the, the whole nature of the theory doesn't have a, a, a huge sort of rational articulation over thousands of years that people, you know, it's just, uh, this, this is the way that uh, a lot of people see things. And the, the uh, reincarnation uh, w would have a uh, critique of the Christian view. And their critique would, would be this, which is that, number one, and it's a good critique, you know, how on earth in a few short years in this world, I mean, some people live to be two days old, uh, some people live to be two years old or 20 years old, or whatever. how are you making a decision that's eternally binding in this tiny little span of time with inadequate information. You know, you don't even know what you're doing. Uh, how can you make that decision? That's an interesting critique. And uh, then you have this very short, uh, very exciting life followed by this endless, extremely boring eternity. You know, uh, so that, that would be a reincarnation, you know, critique of, of sort of the Christian view. And I'm hoping to tackle that uh, let's switch over to, uh, we've talked in previous Bible studies about the rapture, but I want to talk a little bit about uh, a few different ideas that are out there in the Christian world that have some interesting sort of similarities, which is at least the idea that you sort of go and then you come back. You know, the idea that Jesus went and he's coming back, uh, that, that we, uh, if, if you die, uh, then you are waiting somewhere. Either you're sort of in the ground or you're unconscious or something or you're in a disembodied state is another view in heaven uh, waiting for this re-embodiment that's going to happen and that the, that the last day the Lord is going to bring the dead and the living to get you know the, the living are, are raptured and and then everybody comes together and, and you reign with Christ for a thousand years and then you know what happens after that nobody knows but there's a, a, a new heaven and a new earth and so on um, and uh, so, and it's wrapped up with ideas of the second coming, obviously. So you have sort of confused pictures of like what exactly is going on up there. Obviously, there's also in Christianity very much an idea that angels are a separately created race that don't have genders and have never tasted the joys of steak. And, uh, and so they envy people who've had the joy of steak and, and, and um, you know, wish they could live in, in our world and experience what we experience. And so you have people who are in heaven, but they're not angels. And, um, you know, and all the while, 
while there were these weird thoughts about going there and coming back and being physically reconstituted in your flesh, even though that may have been blown apart, you know, in a truck bomb or it may have been in the bottom of the sea or they can't find pieces of you or, or you know, blown up in an airplane or a space shuttle or whatever. <laughs> but uh, somehow it'll all come back together. I mean, God is omnipotent. He can do that stuff. And so he can get you back together and then you'll, you'll walk the earth again. And uh, some people even believe that when you come back here in the physical world, you will have a spiritual body. So you have a spiritual body here in the physical world, and that's how you're able to last uh, forever in this world. So heaven's sort of a temporary uh, storage tank, you know, uh, for, for people who died before the rapture. And then you'll, so you, you'll really come back. This is where it's all gonna, gonna happen is when it comes back and everybody's waiting for this, this last day. So uh, this is quite a confusing set of thoughts. So in contrast with that, um, the new church view, very briefly put, is that uh, when people are conceived in this world, they, you know, uh, people start, and I'm not trying to weigh in on when, when does the personality begin or whatever, but just, just that you're, when you're born into this world, that's a new person that never existed before. That person then is, a, is born, is a baby, is a young person grows up and so on, and at whatever point death catches up with them, you, you roll into the spiritual world where you live, that's, that's your home uh, forever in that spiritual world. And you're given lots of chances to choose where you go and all that kind of stuff. But it's a, a one here and then off there and boom. You know, that's, that's the new church view. And the new church view is that it's not boring in heaven. Uh, the new church is, view is that it's a, it's a world of development, of constant development. That's where it really gets started. I would, I'm hoping to have some time tonight to talk a little more about, about that and why we're not told anything about it. Because it's extremely strange. Uh, I don't know, maybe I'll just blurt it out now because I probably won't get back to it. But uh, the, um, it's, a, it's a very odd, the, the Bible, as I've mentioned before, is a very odd story because it's all building up to this wedding at the end. And you don't see the wedding and you don't see what happens, anything about afterwards. And it's very bizarre. It's sort of like, you know, like what you would expect is that if you were seeing uh, an advertisement for something, you know, that was saying, look, heaven is really great. It would be like an advertisement for the, for the wonderful island of Aruba. And someone would come on there and say, look, this is a great place to go. You're going to love it. The beaches are so beautiful. The, the lowest temperature ever recorded is 68 degrees Fahrenheit. You will never be cold there. It's going to be great. But what the Bible seems to do, instead of telling us about the end, it just talks about the goal. It, it, I mean, it doesn't talk about the goal. It talks about how to get there. It just talks about, you know, it's like an ad that didn't tell you anything about Aruba. It just said, if you want to go to Aruba, take a bus, a train, a plane. It's going to be a rough ride. It's going to be expensive and difficult, uh, you know. <laughs> That's sort of the message of the Bible. It's very odd that you don't have more of it. Well, tell me, what, you know, what is that going to be like when it's so great? Um, well, God will be in you and you'll be in God. Well, what's that like? <laughs> you, know, you don't get any information. And uh, you would think, being new church, that, you know, when Swedenborg comes along and he's explaining so much, three and a half million Latin words, and Latin words are much more efficient than English ones. It takes about six or seven million English words to say what he said in three and a half million Latin words. And so you say, well, Swedenborg, what is it going to be like? Well, true Christianity, he's building up to the end. He gets to chapter 14 where he's going to tell you about the second coming and the new church and the new heaven and the new earth and all that good stuff. And what he says is, what is it going to be like? I can only say by quoting some passages from the Old Testament and the book of Revelation. <laughs> and you read those passages and they say, God will be in you and you'll be in God. That's what it says. <clears throat> Weird. You know, how could you advertise a place by not telling you? The only way the racket works is that people are so uh, soul sick, so much in pain, that they don't know anything about Aruba, but it's probably better than what I've got. And that's the motivation for, okay, I'll get on a bile, I'll take a shot, you know? And I think it must be to protect... Uh, 
the, the true, what it truly is from, from profanation and so forth, we're really not actually told. We really actually don't know what that looks like. But we're told it's good, it's going to be nice, and it involves being in the Lord and the Lord in you. Okay, so uh, let's look at reincarnation in particular, uh, but we'll also have a few little sidebars about the rapture. Uh, let's turn uh, to the last book of the Old Testament. That is Malachi, so it's right before Matthew. It's actually on the right-hand half of your book because uh, the Old Testament is much larger than the New. And look at Malachi right at the very end. You're probably familiar with this, friends. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. You know, there's, a, there's this sense that this great thing is coming. And what does it say in 4 verse 5 right there, my good reader? Behold, I will send you <clears throat> Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Oh, okay. I will send you Elijah the prophet. Is Elijah the prophet alive at the time that this is written? No, he's already dead. Elijah's already lived and died, and yet there's a prophecy here that Elijah's going to be sent. Hmm, okay. Well, there are little hints in, in the Old New Testaments uh, that give the suggestion of some sort of reincarnation. Uh, turn to the right just a little bit into the Gospel of Matthew to chapter 11, if you would, friends. Chapter 11. Verses 12 to 14. Oh, 12 to 15. Let's do it. This is all about John the Baptist. <laughs> okay? Jesus talking about John the Baptist. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to receive it, he is Elijah who is to come. Oh, wait. John the Baptist is Elijah? John the Baptist is Elijah. Hmm, it said in the Old Testament, Elijah's going to come. Now here's Jesus in the New Testament saying, Elijah did come. He was John the Baptist. And what's that last verse there? He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Ah, now see, that's usually a little clue that, you know, when the when the... <clears throat> like there's sort of ordinary correspondential, you know, heavily laden in metaphor. And then occasionally when they go even deeper, they alert you by saying, he who has ears to hear, let him hear, you know. And so it's saying, understand me right here. I'm, I'm saying something mystical. All right, but you can see something there. Now turn to Matthew chapter 17. So go to the right to uh, Matthew 17, just a few pages on. And let's read verses 10 to 13 in Matthew 17 there. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Ah, that's that prophecy from Malachi. <clears throat> Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already. Mm. And they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. Aha! Uh -huh. So he says Elijah has come already, and, and uh, Elijah is in some sense John the Baptist. All right. So you have, um, oh, let's say Elijah, uh, John the Baptist. Okay, let's turn now to uh, Mark. So it's the next gospel to the right. Mark chapter 6. We're flipping around as we often do in this Bible study, looking at these different themes. Now, how did John the Baptist die? Herod cut off his head. And that whole story about how that came about. You remember that. Okay. So then Herod finds out that there's this Jesus who's doing miracles. Mark chapter 6, verses 14 to 16. I think is what now, we King Herod heard of him. For his name, heard of Jesus, yeah. For his name had become well known. And he said, John the Baptist is risen from the dead. Ah. And therefore these powers are at work in him. Others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is the prophet, or like one of the prophets. 
But when, <clears throat> but when Herod heard, he said, this is John whom I beheaded. He has been raised from the dead. So it's a bad day when someone you beheaded comes back to life. <laughs> and you might be interested to know, we don't all have to turn there, good friends. I can just read you the quote, but I think it's John 10, 41 that says, John did no miracle. So while John was alive, he did no miracles. Now he's back from the dead. And by the way, he's got miraculous powers now. So this is a bad day for Herod. Okay, and he's convinced. And you see, there are other theories there. So... Uh, John the Baptist has come back as Jesus. But some people are also saying, no, that's Elijah. And some are saying, no, that's another prophet. That's another one of the old prophets. So Jesus is, is a reincarnation of, of one of these uh, great figures from the past. And can you turn to back to Matthew chapter 16? Sort of a related passage here. Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 and 14. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. That's it. Thank you. And uh, let's look, flip quickly on to Luke which comes after Mark, so a parallel passage to that, but it adds one more name to the mix. Luke chapter 9, verses 18 to 20. Oh, is there? No, did I get the right one? No, no, this is not the one I want. There's another passage uh, that, that mentions um, Jeremiah as well. I don't have the that right passage. That's what we read. The one you just read had Jeremiah. Okay, great. Jeremiah, one of the prophets, Elijah, John the Baptist, is Jesus. So uh, you can see that there's, there's a theory here that's operative uh, that these people come back, that Elijah's come back at John the Baptist. So what I want to do is look at other biblical passages to see does this hold water? You know, what, what do the scriptures teach? about the nature of life after death. And I've got to pause and say another thing here, friends, which is that it is astounding how little uh, knowledge there is about life after death out there. Like if you take the Schaff Herzog Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge, I think it's 13 volumes, a thousand pages in each volume. How much do they have on life after death? You think it's an important topic? I forget whether it's four pages or six pages, and it says almost nothing. It says, well, there are archangels. We don't know what they are. Uh, you know, we don't know much. A tiny little, you know, I don't know what they're saying in all those other 13,000 pages, but uh, uh, the idea of life after death is just not somehow getting through. And yet Swedenborg says at the beginning of heaven and hell, people should be able to know this from the word. People should be able to know how life after death works from the word. So I want to look at that. Turn to Luke chapter 20. So we're going to look at a few little themes here about, about life after death. We're going to plow through a bunch of verses. We always read them too quickly and say too little about them, friends. That's how it works around here. Okay. Luke chapter 20, verses 34 to 38. Very familiar passage. Jesus answered and said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are accounted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Now you could think from there that, you, that only certain people are worthy to attain the resurrection from the dead. And you can certainly get from other scriptures that I don't have in front of me here the idea that the good people live but evil people just die or something like as if you cease to exist or something like that. Uh, but as is so often the case, hang on a few verses because you'll get a different impression. Keep going. Nor can they die anymore, mm. for they are equal to they the They don't angels. die anymore. So you get the idea that you only die once, and then you cannot die again. You don't, you know, isn't that evidence that you don't come back around and go through another death? It says that you, you don't die anymore after that. Go on. For they are equal to the angels and are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. But even Moses showed in the burning bush passage 
that the dead are raised when he called the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. For he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. For all live in him. Oh, all. Not just some. Not just those who get the resurrection, you know, that it talked about in verse 35. But all. All live in him. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, everybody else. So this passage to me teaches a universal resurrection. It doesn't mean everybody goes to heaven, but everybody lives. You know, everybody lives after death. All live, including these people long dead. They, he's not God of the dead, but of the living, for all live in him. Uh, turn to the Gospel of John, which is to the right. The next one coming up there. This is an interesting one. It's a little challenging. But if you think, uh, I'll write something on the board in a minute. Just a warning. Okay, go ahead. Uh, John, John 5, verses 24 to 29. Sorry. Okay. John 5, verses 24 to 29. Okay. Most assuredly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who has sent me has everlasting life. Mm, now, you could think there, again, that some live on after death and some don't. Because if you believe in Jesus, then, then you live. Go on. Um, and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. Most assuredly, I say to mm. you, the hour is coming and now is. Now is. The hour now is. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself, and has given him authority <clears throat> to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. All right, thank you. Who? that's an interesting kind of challenging passage, isn't it? Now, he says the hour now is. The hour now is. And there are people in the graves, and they'll come forth out of their graves, and those who have done good will come forth under the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. Now you can see how people could read that and say, well, that's talking about your physical grave. People will come out of their physical graves, and then there will be something in this physical world called the resurrection of life, and something in this physical world called the resurrection of damnation. And we don't know what that is. But from a new church standpoint, uh, think about this. You've got heaven. Uh, you have hell. And then you have what Swedenborg calls the world of spirits. And people go to the world of spirits while they're being processed, he says. And isn't it interesting, uh, the thought that these are the graves and this is the resurrection of life. And this is the resurrection of death. What a strange phrase, huh? And it says all that are in the graves. So again, all are going to be processed. All go to this area. Because although there is that passage, and it's difficult to deal with, there is that passage in Matthew that says that uh, at, the, at the time of the crucifixion, uh, in Matthew, it says that the tombs were opened and many of the saints appeared in the city and stuff like that. And it sounds like people came out of the graves. That's the only indication of people coming out of the graves. And Swedenborg points out the fact that it doesn't say which city. And it doesn't even say which world that city is in. Uh, and the other gospel writers don't capture that little fact. But he says that actually that was something that occurred in the world of spirits because it relates to the souls who were under the altar, people who were in the in the processing they were stuck in that processing part and that's what I think is meant here by the graves they're in the graves and some come forth to the resurrection of life and some to the resurrection of death and this affects everyone I can't prove it to you yet friends but but that's my reading of it let's keep turning to the right into the acts we won't be frightened this is good books for the church Acts chapter 24 Verse 15, it's just a little one verse thing here. I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. All right. 
both the just and the unjust. All right, so it's not a salvation of, it's not a resurrection of good people and the evil just die a thousand deaths and they're gone. You know, that's not what it is. It's, uh, it's a resurrection of the just and the unjust. That's why he can talk about a resurrection of death and a resurrection of life uh, because everybody's alive in the spiritual world. Okay, so the, those, those scriptures are on the point that all survive death. The next point that we want to cover is that survival of death is immediate and it's personal. Like a key concept in reincarnation is uh, you come to an end when you die. Your soul, fine, you know, but you are done. That soul may manifest next time around as an elephant or another person, could be female, could be different race, whatever, you know, but, but this you is done. I would submit, friends, this is just my own, uh, you know, heinous point of view, but I would submit that uh, when I think about myself, I, I would be happy to stop existing. Uh, I, I, I would love to be rid of myself. I, you know, my little smelly outer self that I have to wear around all day and, and uh, all the time. You know, it would be a great relief. But when I think about anybody else, I don't want someone I love to be reincarnated. I don't want to go to the spiritual world and find out, oh no, they're not here, they're a frog or they're, they're something back in the physical, <laughs> you know, that doesn't do anything for me, you know. I want them. I don't mind if they're cleared up a little bit, a few of their little dysfunctions are, you know, straightened out. I don't mind if they sort of died and went to heaven a little bit. But I don't want an entirely different creature. The reincarnation is this weird idea that there are actually fewer people than there seem to be, you know. Because we're sort of recycled, you know, the, 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 there are these old souls and everything, you know, we're, we're recycled people. Uh, I'm very attached to the magnificent creativity that the Lord does in creating all these different people. It also seems to me that this idea that your higher self sits down and decides all this stuff is kind of taking to yourself something that is actually the Lord, you, you know, like, like that's a divine power to be able to see, you know, the nature of your life and so on. Um, so I want to show you passages in Scripture that show, that suggest at least, in Scripture's usually arcane and cryptic language, uh, that, that survival of death is immediate, or if not immediate, it, it's at least within three days. And I want to show you passages that suggest that survival of death is personal, like the you that you were is still you in the spiritual world. And this is taught in Scripture, right in the literal sense. Let's turn back, friends, to 1 Samuel, okay? So we're after the five books of Moses and Joshua and Judges, but if you're in the Kings, if that's too far to the right. I'm talking about 1 Samuel chapter 28. I love this dramatic passage. It's so wonderful. Uh, I should just set it up a bit because we don't have long enough to read it all. But Saul is in deep trouble and he's been consulting the Lord and the Lord won't take his phone calls. And uh, he tries texting him, uh, everything, you know, nothing. And uh, so he's very upset. And he himself has forbidden uh, witches and mediums and so forth in the land. But he finds that well, he really wants to talk to Samuel. Samuel was his prophet while Samuel was alive in this world. Samuel's now died, and Saul wants to go raise Samuel from the dead and, and communicate with him. And so he goes to this woman at Endor. She's very worried about it because it's been outlawed, and if she gets caught, she's in trouble. And Saul says, nothing bad will happen to you. And so verse 11, 1 Samuel 28, I don't know if I said that yet. Then the woman said, whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried out with a loud voice. And the woman spoke to Saul, saying, why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. Now, how does she know? We don't know how she found out. But somehow, as soon as she sees Samuel, she knows that Saul is Saul. That's interesting. Go ahead. And the king said to her, Do not be afraid. What did you see? And the woman said to Saul, I saw a spirit ascending out of the earth. So he said to her, What is this form? Oh, well, this is interesting. What form does Samuel have? Samuel's died. What form does Samuel have? She can see into the spiritual world. What form does Samuel have? 
Does he have wings or is he a disembodied creature like people say he is? Is he just an energy or an evanescence or something? What does he look like? Uh, so he's, uh, and she said, an old man is coming. An old up. man, well that's disappointing. I thought we got over that in the spiritual world. An old, he's an old man, like he was in the world? He's an old man, okay. An old man is coming up and he's covered with a mantle. He's wearing the same clothes that he wore when he was here in the physical world. I mean, the same looking type of clothes, you know, that's what the prophets would wear. They'd wear a mantle. You know, you remember when uh, Elijah's taken up and his mantle falls down to Elisha. That's what the prophet, that's how you could tell without a, a scorecard, you could tell who the prophets were because they had a mantle. So he's wearing his mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. You see, he only needed two details, old man, mantle, oh, it is Samuel. You got the right person. Uh, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed down. Now Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? And Saul answered, I am deeply distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me and does not answer me anymore, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called you, that you may reveal to me what I should do. Then Samuel said, So why do you ask me, seeing the Lord has departed from you and has become your enemy? <laughs> you really think you're going to get a better answer from me? <laughs> and the Lord has done for himself as he spoke by me. For the Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, David, because you did not obey the voice of the Lord, nor execute his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore the Lord has done this thing to you this and day. Listen to this. Moreover, the Lord will also deliver Israel with you into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow, you and your sons will be with me. Tomorrow, you and your sons will be with me. Not three days from now. Tomorrow, you and your sons will be with me. Samuel has personally survived death. He's still the same cantankerous prophet that he was, wearing a similar mantle, still similarly fed up with Saul and his crazy antics. And he says, tomorrow, you and your sons, oh, I thought when they died, they were going to vaporize and be reincarnated. No, you and your sons are going to be with, tomorrow, you and your sons will be with me. Immediate, personal survival of death. This is what scripture teaches. Uh, let's get a slightly different, different impression from the uh, book of Hosea. Okay, it's going to be a little bit of a challenge to find, but it's right after... Daniel in the prophets. So you turn to the right and go through Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, and so forth. Then you get to Hosea. And it's kind of a cryptic statement. It's from a prophet. But it's Hosea chapter 6, verse 2. Okay. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up, that we may live in his sight. Thank you. Okay, there's a classic passage. Two days he'll revive us. On the third day, he'll raise us up. Now, it doesn't say it's about life after death or whatever. It's just been talking about how the Lord has torn and he will bind us and so on. But it's a, a, but it's a poignant statement. And Jesus picks it up in the New Testament and actually says that he's going to do this reviving for us. Um... Let's turn to Luke, so keep turning to the right till you get to Matthew, Mark, and then Luke. We've got a bunch of passages in Luke that address this situation. It's interesting, so many of them are in Luke. Luke chapter 12, we'll start with verses 4 and 5. Now again, the Bible's, you know, it's, it's cryptically worded and so forth. But what we're looking at is personal and immediate survival of death, one or the other or both. Go and ahead. I say to you, my friends, do not be afraid of those who kill the body, and after that have no more that they can do. But I will show you whom you should fear. Fear him who, after he has killed, has power to cast into hell. Yes, I say to you, fear him. Now, do you see why I would bring that up now? that there's the killing of the body and then after that there's being cast into hell it's not reincarnation you don't come back you know and it says uh you know the suggestion is that 
you will be, you know, you as a person, you know, you will be cast into hell or not. You know, don't be afraid of those who can kill the body. And it doesn't specify who not to be, you know, is it talking about God? Is it talking about the devil or whatever? But, but uh, that does suggest something about life after death. Turn to chapter 13. Verse 28, another statement from Jesus that bears on life after death. We'll just read that one verse there. Luke 13, verse 28. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God and yourselves thrust out. Now, from a Swedenborgian standpoint, we would say, oh, well, those have internal meanings and so forth. On the, in the literal sense of it, saying you will see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets. They're, they're up there. You know, they're up there in the kingdom. They're not in the ground. They're not dead. They're not waiting to be reconstituted in their physical bodies. They're there in, in, the, in the afterlife, in, in the other world. Okay, turn to chapter 16. Now, this one is in a parable. And in some ways, the way that even though the Lord is all about divine truth, he's quite sneaky, don't you find, friends? Uh, this parable has a lot of stuff about life after death sort of snuck into it. And uh, this is about the rich man and Lazarus. So 16 verses 19 and following there. There was a certain rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus full of sores who was laid at his gate desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So the rich man's in a great situation, and Lazarus is in a terrible situation. Go on. So it was that the beggar died, and he was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. Wow, that's nice. <laughs> and that happened pretty quickly. Like he died, and he, was he didn't cease to exist. He didn't cease to be Lazarus. He was carried by the angels to the bosom of Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. Now, isn't that interesting? One's carried by angels into the bosom of Abraham, the other one's buried. You know, buried is a word about hell, you know, but still, okay, he's buried. And being in torments in Hades, he lifted up Hades his eyes. Hades is hell, right? He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. So there's Abraham. Abraham's still existing. Now, if everybody's waiting to, you know, come back into this physical world, what's, why is Abraham alive and well in that spiritual world and still being Abraham? You know, what's going on there? And there's Lazarus and there's the rich man. and They're all still conscious. They still recognize each other. They can see each other, right? Go on. Then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted and you are tormented. And I don't believe that simply means that the poor do well in the spiritual world and the rich do badly. It's about the spiritual state they're in, as you can see in, as the story unfolds. But it does give hope that it's not simply personal immediate survival of death, but there, there is some change to your circumstance. You know, so Lazarus' circumstances have changed. His circumstance is better than it was. In this world, he was suffering. In the other world, he's happy. In this world, the rich man was happy. Now he's suffering. Go on. And besides all this, between us and you, there was a great gulf fixed. That world of spirits right there. So that those who want to pass from here to you cannot, nor can those from there pass to us. Then he said, I beg you, therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers that he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Oh, how would they avoid coming to that place of torment? Read on. Abraham said to him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they will repent. They will repent. That's how you get out of the torment. Is it a theme of this Bible study? It might be. <laughs> Repentance. 
and belief in the Lord. How you get from heaven to hell is, is repentance. And who knows it now? The rich man knows it, right? I've got to get a message to my brothers who are still alive in the world that they've got to repent so that their situation is good when they come to this other side or else they'll be in torment. And he said, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. Mm, there it is. All right. Okie doke, and turn to Luke chapter 23. Now that's just a parable, but it contains actually as much truth as anywhere you're going to find about the nature of life after death. There's immediate personal survival. Uh, there's alteration of circumstances. Whether you repented or not in this life makes a big difference to your circumstances there. And Abraham and everybody else, just you all go there, and there you are. And you can all see each other. You're all the same person you used to be. You know, your situation may have changed, but, but you're still identifiably Abraham and the rich man and Lazarus. Uh, Luke 23, verse 43. Oh, yes. Uh, verse 42. This is Jesus, and he's got, this is on the cru during the crucifixion, he's on the cross. You know where I'm going with this. He's got one criminal on one side, and the, that criminal is just reviling the Lord. And here's another criminal on the other side. And what does he say to Jesus in verse 42? He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Yeah, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Like, okay, eventually I know you're going to come into your kingdom. And could you remember me then at the end of days when you come into your kingdom and we all get out of the graves or whatever's going to happen at the end of time? And Jesus says, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Yeah, three important words in there. Well, paradise is also an important word. Today, same as 1 Samuel 28. You know, tomorrow you and your sons will be here. But Jesus is saying today immediate survival of death you will be with me not vague essences of vapor will be with each other in some vague nebulous unintelligible world but you will be with me in paradise you're going to immediately survive death i'm going to immediately survive death the two of us will be together in paradise today immediate personal survival of death this is the teaching of Scripture. So you have to s take passages like this with a grain of salt in the faith, you know, some idea that Elijah's come back. We'll see some more about that in a minute. Um, okay. Uh, now, I want to look at some Scriptures that say that we don't come back, friends. All right? Uh, let's turn all the way back to 2 Samuel. Okay, so you found 1 Samuel before. 2 Samuel, by some strange artifact of mathematics, comes after 1 Samuel. Uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12. And uh, this is the story of David, you know, David, his adultery with the Bathsheba. And there was a child born, and the prophet Nathan said, the child is going to die, you know, because of your sin. And lo and behold, the child did get very, very sick. And while the child is sick, David is agonizing. He's fasting. It's a very dramatic, wonderful story. We don't have time for it all. And finally, when he dies, the, his servants are very worried that what is he going to do when the kid dies? Because he's just beside himself now. And what David does is he gets dressed, he goes and worships in the temple, and then he goes home and he sits down and he eats some bread. And they're just, what are you doing? I don't understand it, you know? And his explanation is in verse 22. And he said, while the child was alive, I fasted and wept. For I said, who can tell whether the Lord will be gracious to me? Verse 23, yes. That the child may live. But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? No! You can't bring him back again. What? Tell me the next thing. I shall go to him, but he shall not return to me. He shall not return to me. That's not how it works. You don't come back. David's going to go where the son is. The son is not coming back to where David is. Crucial teaching of Scripture. I shall go to him. He shall not return to me. Not how it works. Uh, turn to John, the Gospel of John. We're really getting some exercise here. Just want to cover the entire scriptures as much as possible in one night. Uh, John chapter 14, verses 2 and 3, a very beautiful scripture. This is Jesus talking to the disciples, talking to everyone, I guess. 
In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. I. Jesus is going to survive death and still be Jesus. And he's going to make a place for you because you're going to survive death as well. And he goes to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. So again, just this sense of uh, now the Lord is going to come back for us. But in other words, what I get out of this in this context is that the Lord is going to come for us and we are going to be where the Lord is. He's not coming here. He's going to prepare a place for us there. We're going there. He's, he's not, you know, it says something about he'll, he'll come back. But the essence of it is that where he is in that spiritual world, there we may be also. That's, that's the thrust of it. It's all too obvious to say in a way. But, but I love these teachings. Uh, Acts. Now, there are different. So keep turning after John to the Acts. Acts chapter 13, verse 34. This is different in certain uh, translations. Uh, but I think it's very powerful, and I think the way Carr is going to read it is exactly accurate to the Greek. Go. And Acts 13, 34. And that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. This is about God and Jesus. He raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption. Now, corruption here means decay, this whole physical world of decay and corruption. Jesus is no more to return to corruption. Now, you may have translations there that say something about decay and, 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 and skip the part about returning. But it's in the Greek. Hupostrephein, to the diaphoron, you know, uh, to, to return, to, to come on back to, to corruption. Jesus is no more to return to corruption. So whatever this thing is about Jesus coming in the clouds, it didn't it say the clouds of heaven, you know, or in Acts 1 verse 9 where it says that he goes up and they're seeing angels and the angels say, as you saw him go up, he'll come back. Well, if you're seeing angels, hello, you're not in the physical world. You know, he's, he's, he's coming in a spiritual way and he's coming to us in the pages of scripture. No more to return to cor corruption. The same as David's son, he's, he's not coming back. He's not coming back in the physical. He's not coming back and getting another physical body. That's not the order of it, and that's not how it works. And finally, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. So keep going to the right, keep going to the right, and you'll get through a bunch of epistles and things, and, and a number of them start with T, like Timothy and Titus and so forth. And then you get to the Hebrews. Okay, and if you get to James or First John, Peter, stuff like that, that's gone too far. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, and a very important scripture. Very important scripture. 9, verse 27. And as it is appointed for men to die once. Once. But after this, the judgment. Once. You die once. You don't die again and again and again. Scripture does not actually teach reincarnation. Once. It's appointed man to die once. And after that, the judgment. It doesn't say tens of thousands of years after that, or please hold, we'll be right with you. The second <laughs> coming will be occurring shortly. Uh, no, it, it, you die, and after that, the judgment. That's how it works. All right. Uh, oh, we just have to go look at... Um, I can't think which one I want to do. Uh, Luke, maybe um, chapter 9. Luke chapter 9, the transfiguration. See, there's this idea that Elijah turned into John the Baptist, and maybe John the Baptist turned into Jesus or something. But in the transfiguration, Peter, James, and John go up on a mountain to pray. And uh, pick up in verse 29, if you would. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, mm. and his robe became white and glistening. Okay, he's lifted up, and so his, his whole demeanor changes. And behold, two men talked with him. Men? Who were Moses and Elijah. Oh, Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah had a conversation with him. Well, wait a minute. I thought Elijah turned into John the Baptist. 
How can Elijah be still alive in the spiritual world having a conversation with Jesus if he turned into John the Baptist? If, if that Elijah self ceased to exist and that spirit came down into John the Baptist and then ran around as John the Baptist and then got beheaded and then came back as Jesus, how can Elijah still be alive in the spiritual world and talking to Jesus? See, it doesn't square with the scriptures. Moses and Elijah are still alive. It describes them as men. They're human beings. They're not essences. They're not vapors. They're not whatever. You know, they're people. And they're having a conversation with him. And what's their conversation about, good friend? Oh, and look at this next phrase. Go ahead. Uh, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory. Isn't that nice? Now, they appeared in glory. You know, they're not just the same old boring Moses and Elijah who existed <laughs> in this world. They've, they've died and gone to heaven. You, you know, they've got an upgrade like Lazarus did. But... Uh, but they're still who they are, and they're still talking. And what's the topic of their discussion? Uh, and they spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Hmm, interesting topic of conversation. So Peter, James, and John go up on the mountain, and there's Jesus discussing with Moses and Elijah. Yeah, well, how do you think it's going to work? Yeah, yeah, I know. And they're having this conversation about his pending death in Jerusalem and uh, so and and then at the very end of this experience it, we, it was wonderful stuff we can't read it all uh, down in verse 36 and then when the voice was passed Jesus was found alone up there which I think is tremendously meaningful um, so maybe we can solve this little puzzle right now uh, what does Elijah mean literal sense of the word what do the prophets mean Literal sense of the word, as it turns out. How about Jeremiah? Literal sense of the word, as it turns out. What does John the Baptist mean? Oh, literal sense of the word, as it turns out. And who is Jesus? He's the spiritual meaning within the word. He is, you know, he is the word. He's the whole word. It's very interesting that the only people in Scripture who are ever said to reincarnate into each other all mean the word. So it's kind of interesting because when you think about the word, the word existed first as a kind of revelation of, in, in dreams and so forth to the most ancient church. Got written down by Enoch and so on and it became codified in the ancient word. Then was reincarnated as the Old Testament. Hello. Then was reincarnated as the New Testament and so on. And so, yes, the word goes through an interesting kind of reincarnation. But no, Elijah the person didn't reincarnate into John the Baptist, the person. And John the Baptist, the person, didn't reincarnate into Jesus, the person. That's not how it works. So it has a meaning, but, but that's not how it works. And, and when you get right down to it, it's Jesus alone. That's who's at the end of the story. That, that's who you've got. So how does it work? Hmm, how does it work? <laughs> does Scripture ever discuss how, how this whole thing works? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Does it ever talk about that? 1 Corinthians, so you go past Acts and the Romans, and you get out into the Corinthians there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, this whole chapter is sort of a riff about the dead, but uh, let's pick up at verse 35 in 1 Corinthians 15, if you would, friend. But someone will say, how are the dead raised up, and with what body do they come? Oh, is that a question that seems to be relevant to our discussion this evening? Oh, I think so. How are the dead raised up and with what body? Do, well, how does this work? Like, okay, so you had a physical body and then you're raised up. Well, how, how does that work exactly? Okay, and so he goes on to this wonderful uh, thing here. And uh, just skip down to verse 42 in the interest of time. But it starts to talk about the, the natural body and the spiritual body in this amazing little discourse. So also is the resurrection of the dead. The body is sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. There's corruption. No more to return to corruption. Jesus is not going to return to the corruption of the physical body or the decay of this physical world. It's sown in corruption. It is raised in incorruption. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. Oh, we just saw Moses and Elijah in glory. Did we not? Lazarus wasn't doing badly either. Right? It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. Could you be clearer, please, Paul? I'm not quite getting the thrust of what you're saying. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. Um, a little clearer. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. All right, I'm starting to get that now. Okay. So there's a natural body 
and there's a spiritual body. And uh, what does it go on to say in verse 46 there? However, the spiritual is not first. Oh, it's not first. The spiritual is not first. Oh, oh, the spiritual is not first. Well, wait a minute. How do souls hang around in the spiritual world who pre-exist their bodies and decide what's going to happen to them in their life? Hmm, not according to the Corinthians. We don't pre-exist our physical existence. It starts with the natural. It starts with the physical body here. First, the natural body. Okay, go ahead. The spiritual is not first, but the natural, and afterward the spiritual. Okay, good. Thank you. And, uh, oh, let's read this wonderful stuff starting in verse 51. Oh, 50, right there. Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. Wow! Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So how is this going to work when Jesus comes back into flesh and blood and all of us get out of our graves in flesh and blood and we're supposedly in the kingdom of God? How does that work? Well, it doesn't work according to Paul. That's not how it works. Flesh and blood doesn't inherit the kingdom of God. Nor does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I tell you a mystery. Ah, a mystery. Let those who have ears to hear, let them hear. We you know, it's a little signal there. By the way, what follows will be of a mystical nature and not readily understandable according to literal sense. Okay, go ahead. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And people persist in thinking this is talking about the physical world. It'll happen all at once. Everybody will come out of their graves at whenever this last trumpet sounds. The people even think there's going to be some physical loud trumpet blast and this will happen. But that's not what it means. Go on. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Yes, Lord. So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, Hades, where is your victory? Thank you. That's it. So, um, it's obviously to me talking about that the last trumpet is the moment of your physical death. You know, all of us, when we physically die, that's the last trumpet it's talking about. We're all going to go through that. And at that moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we are raised incorruptible as a miracle. You know, we're raised into this spiritual body. It's sown a natural body. It's, it's raised a spiritual body. It's sown in dishonor. It's raised in glory. It's sown in corruption. It's raised in incorruption. And uh, in a moment, we're transformed into a spiritual being. And mortality has put on immortality. Immortality is not be in heaven at a waiting station for a couple of thousand years till Jesus comes and you can get the joy of going back into this physical mud that we wear around. You know, that's not what it said. Immortality is immortality. It's deathlessness. You're in the spiritual world and you continue to exist in that spiritual world. And, uh, and so then you say, oh, death, where's your sting? Oh, you know, Hades, where's your victory? Or grave, where's your victory? Uh, so this is how it works. And let's look at an example. Friends, uh, turn back to the Acts. A wonderful little story. Uh, in Acts chapter 12, in which Peter gets imprisoned. Uh, oh, it's just such a fun story. Uh, let's, let's read this a, a little bit at least. So Herod's been imprisoned. I mean, Herod has imprisoned Peter, wants to make an example of him. And so Herod's bound in chains, and there are keepers before the door who are keeping the prison. Verse 7, if you would. Now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by him, and a light shone in the prison. And he struck Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise, quickly. And his chains fell off his hands. And then the, the angel manages to get him to come out of the prison. And actually, look in verse 9. Peter thought that he was seeing a vision. He, he didn't even think it was really happening, that the doors of the prison were just opening, the shackles fell off, and he's just walking out. So he thinks that he's sort of having a vision. It's not really physically happening, but it is physically happening as it turns out. And they go out through the iron gate that leads to the city. And, uh, and then Peter realizes that it's the angel of the Lord who's done all this. And he comes to a house where many of the Christians were gathered together praying. Verse 13. 
And Great as, little moment here. And as Peter knocked at the door of the gate, a girl named Rhoda came to answer. Okay. When she recognized Peter's voice. Oh, she recognized Peter's voice. Okay, that's an important detail. So she hears someone knocking at the gate. She recognizes Peter's voice, but she hasn't opened the gate. Go on. Because of her gladness, she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter stood before the gate. <laughs> so he's like, hello, just got out of prison. Don't want to be out here too long shouting and knocking on the door. Hello, could be somebody coming up behind me. Could you uh, quickly, yeah, could you hook me up here? And she runs inside. Oh, oh, she's all giddy and a little shook up and kind of, you know, beside herself and everything. And he tells the people, she tells the people inside. Verse 15. But they said to her, you are beside yourself. Yet she kept insisting that it was so. And listen to what they said. So they said, it is his angel. It is his angel. Interesting. It's his angel. Peter, who has not died yet, already has an angel that sounds just like Peter. <laughs> <laughs> you know, has the same voice. Comes to the door, knocks, says, hello, open it up. Oh, it's his angel. You know, his body's still in prison, but his angel, i.e. spiritual body. So there's sort of a suggestion here that we already have that spiritual body. The natural comes first, but the spiritual body forms while we're in this world. And it's his, it's his angel that has his voice Sort of a doppelganger, you know, like a no, no, it's a it's a spiritual version of Peter, who's out there talking and so forth. And uh, so, go ahead, we'll just finish up the story a little bit. Now Peter continued knocking. Yes, uh huh. And when they opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. <laughs> but motioning to them with his hand to keep silent, he declared to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. Thank you. We'll just stop there. But uh, yeah, it's sort of like shh, shh. <laughs> he's been out there, you know, calling and banging and everything. And uh, doesn't want to make a big racket because, you know, they're bound to come after him sooner or later, everything. But I find that very interesting. It's his angel. And they knew, they knew that people who are alive in this world already have angels who sound like them, you know, and that that's Peter's angel. Uh, we just have one more scripture to go. Can you stand it? Let's look at John. So we turn to the left. John 11. Oh, this is an interesting one. It shows that even in, in, in New Testament times, there was a similar sense as we have now that there will be this resurrection at the last day. So John chapter 11, this is about Lazarus. And let's just pick up at verse 23 in the interest of time. This, he's talking to uh, Martha. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. So, you know, Lazarus is dead. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Oh, listen to that. So Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. She says, I know that. We're all going to rise at the last day. You know, there'll be a resurrection at the last day. I, I, yeah, sure. I know he's going to, you know, it's not a huge comfort to me right now because I just lost him. And sure, at the last day, he's going to rise again. It's good news. What does Jesus say to that? Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Yes, and we can skip down to, um, oh, verse 43, just to get the punchline of the story there. Now, when he had said these things, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he who had died came out bound hand and foot with grave clothes, and his face was wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, Loose him and let him go. And I believe he'd been dead for four days at this point. And um, uh, so do you see what he said? She said, Oh, I know he's going to have the resurrection at the last day. We all know about that. Not a huge comfort when you've lost your brother. And Jesus says, I am the last day I'm, I'm here right now. I'm it I am your last day you know and this wasn't the only time he raised someone from the dead he did it several times in the New Testament and so he showed that even in the physical world you know he could it was just an image of that resurrection 
that he gives us. So he's saying, I am the last day. I'm that resurrection. Today you will be with me in paradise. That's what he offers to us. And when you think about Jesus, like do you want Jesus to reincarnate? What's he going to reincarnate as? You know? I don't want him to reincarnate. I don't want any of my loved ones to reincarnate. I don't want them disappearing and ceasing to exist and coming back as something else. I don't mind if they take care of a few of their personal problems. I don't mind seeing them getting up into glory. But my heart doesn't want them to stop. You know? Love doesn't want other people to just come to an end. I think that's more what you think about yourself. Like, boy, I'd be glad to be rid of this, you know? Uh, but is it really what we think about other people that, gosh, I can't wait till you reincarnate, you know? That'll be a blessing, you know? Do people really hope that they'll go to the other life and find out, oh no, they've left, they're now some goat, you know? Or, or, or even a person, you know? There's some other child from some other culture with another name and another personality. See, what it doesn't get to is the nature of the mind you know because the order of it is I, I've likened this before in a Bible to this before in a Bible study I do think there's something to the analogy that uh, our physical body is like the boards in which a basement is poured and then over the course of our lives that spiritual body is formed in a sense the, the concrete that's at first liquid it's wet and you can decide do I want this here or want that there? You can shape it the way that you want. We have choice. We have a brief window of choice here in this world in which we can shape how that looks. But that gets concretized and it has to because that thing's got to last forever. You know? And it's of order that you, you do have your structure and then you pour the basement and everything. But you're going to build a house on that and all kinds of things are going to go on in that house. And it doesn't make sense. I don't think it works to crumble up concrete and reuse it as other concrete. I mean, does it make sense that you're just going to keep pouring tons and tons of different basements on tons and tons of different houses, never live in them for all that long, and then just eventually get vaporized into the sun where you don't really exist as a separate individual anymore, you know? I think the example of Jesus is exactly what happened. And look, if he can go from zero to God in 33 years, we can make it to angel. You know, we can make it in the amount of time that we have, you know? In some ways, the less time, the better. And <laughs> yeah. little kids do better than, than people who become adults. The track record's better. But, but uh, uh, we've got long enough to, to make this decision. Uh, it just is, is frustratingly sort of irrational and wishful thinking to me uh, I can see the idea of spiritual development. I, I think there's tremendous development in the spiritual world. And uh, maybe I can wrap up by, by saying a few words about that. That I actually think that what awaits us in the spiritual world, if we're willing to go through repentance on the slenderest of promises, you know, it's amazing that we wouldn't be told more about what it will be like. We're just told that we'll have love in our hearts and we'll have truth in our minds, right, right, right. And we'll be useful and, and, and the Lord will be with us and, and, uh, and we'll love other people and, and we'll just know truth without even making a great effort or anything. You know, that, that's all much that we're told about it. We'll be saved from evil. Uh, you know, no evil thing will be able to harm us and so forth. But we don't know what all happens after you're in that state. But I think it is so magnificent I encountered a passage the other day where Swedenborg was talking about the state that angels are in, and he just said they're in their inner selves. And, uh, you know, I, I, dear readers, you don't have the equipment to understand anything about what, what they go through. You know, uh, he, he just can't say much about what it's like. It's just like, it's good, trust me, go through repentance, it'll be painful, but Aruba's really great. You know, I think you'll like it. <laughs> And, uh, and wonderful things are going to happen there without end. Another thing that, that Swedenborg says that, that's uh, really magnificent is that every stage of life is just an egg to the stage that's to come. And so to all eternity, we never leave being an egg to the limitless things that have yet to come. Or another thing he says is that we're like a seedling that grows up into a shoot and then grows and develops branches and then bears fruit. And in the fruit there are seeds and more seedlings grow. And so we become a whole grove of trees and a forest 
of forests without end. He can't even describe what it is or what that's like. What does that feel like? You know, there's growth without end. What does that feel like? Purification and sanctification without end. An ongoing process of becoming better and better and better and better and better. What does that feel like? We, we can hardly even imagine what that feels like. It might terrify us if we, if we knew what it is. But it's good. The Lord is in us and we're in the Lord. And perhaps the most moving thing in what we've read tonight to me is the Lord saying, you know, I go to prepare a place for you. I want to be with you. I care about you as an individual. I made you as an individual, not a, a, a recycled thing. I'm interested in you. You're a special project of mine. And you're unique. Everyone on the face of the planet is unique. We can see it. Even people with the same DNA, identical twins. You know, we're all amazingly different. We have overlapping characteristics and so forth. And yet, is there one that you could take away and say, yeah, well, it didn't really matter that that person existed, you know? There's not one. Have you had the experience? I've had the experience of going through airports when I'm far away from home. And I look for my love. And no one in the airport is the one I love, you know? Every face is wrong. Everybody's wrong. They're all, they've all got it wrong. They're not the one that I love. Am I going to be satisfied with reincarnation? Do I want my love to be reincarnated? I don't want that. That's not what I want, you know? And I think that desire comes from the Lord. The Lord feels that way about all of us, you know? He loves all of us, treasures all of us, a lot more than we love ourselves. And he's not going to throw that out. He didn't make that to just toss that, crunkle it up, start again. Another little go around and everything like that. True spiritual development happens in being one person and going through repentance and dying, going into the spiritual world and then rising into that glory that Moses and Abraham and Lazarus find themselves in. And uh, the book doesn't even bother to say what that's like, but I think it's going to be good. I think it's going to be good. Uh, anyway, we've run out of time. Let's close with the Lord's Prayer, if you will, friends. Join hands in a circle. Lord Jesus Christ, you are the resurrection. You are the way and the truth and the life. Teach us, Lord, to believe in you and to live in such a way that we may be with you. It is humbling, Lord, to know how much you love us and that you prepare a place for us so that you may be with us in the spiritual world. Thank you for showing us what it is to be born into this world, to live in this world, to be transformed, and to go to the other world and to have a home there forever. Our Father, who art in the heavens, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, as in heaven, so upon the earth. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you, friends. Thank you for coming. Thanks for your questions. God bless you here in the flesh and online.